This morning, we're going to continue our exploration of the response, the implications in response to the PTS slavery audit. Uh, we began yesterday by hearing from colleagues from other academic institutions who have done slavery audits, and we wanted to learn from them some things that they have learned about how to respond and what to do going forward, and that was very helpful. And then last night, we heard from Darnell Moore, a PTS graduate who is a social activist and helped us to think about theological education for the sake of social witness and social engagement. This morning, we are going to continue the exploration and conversation by focusing on theological education for leadership in the churches. And to do that, we have our very distinguished guest, who is also a friend and former faculty member at Princeton Seminary, and that is Luke Powery. And when he's tired of wandering in the wilderness, we got a place for him <laughs> back here. <laughs> so the Reverend Dr. Luke Powery uh, is the Dean of Duke University Chapel and Associate Professor of Homiletics there. Uh, his teaching and research interests focus on preaching, worship, pneumatology, and culture. And his publications in include Dem Dry Bones, Preaching, Death, and Hope, and his most recent book, Were You There? The Latin, or Latin Reflections on the Spirituals. And also with Sally Brown, one of our respondents, he is uh, co-author of Ways of the Word, Learning to Preach for Your Time and Place. So we'll hear from him first, and uh, then we will have two faculty respondents, former colleagues, uh, and uh, here at Princeton Seminary, first we will hear, just in alphabetical order, Eric Barreto, who is my next door neighbor, and uh, we see each other at meetings more than in our backyard, but uh, the Weyerhaeuser Associate Professor of New Testament. Uh, and he is a Baptist minister, and prior to coming to Princeton Seminary, he was on the faculty of Luther Seminary. And he regularly writes for and teaches in faith communities around the country, very ecclesially engaged. He's also a leader in the Hispanic Theological Initiative Consortium, which is a national ecumenical and interconstitutional consortium uh, involving several seminaries um, around the country. His recent publications include Exploring the Bible that he co-authored with Michael Chan, Reading Theologically, and New Proclamation Year C in the year 2013, Easter through Christ the King co-offered with David Lott. And last and certainly not least, Sally Brown, who is the Elizabeth M. Engel Professor of Worship, Preaching and Worship. She's an ordained Presbyterian minister with over 20 years of pastoral experience. And uh, her academic interests include the theology and rhetoric of the cross and contemporary preaching with attention to issues raised by feminist theology and postmodern hermeneutics. She teaches preaching here at the master's and doctoral level and is also the director of the Joe R. Engel Institute of Preaching. And with Dr. Powery, she uh, wrote that one book, and also uh, she also wrote a book, Crosstalk, which is Preaching Redemption Here and Now, and also Lament, Proclaiming Practices in Pulpit, Pew, and Public Square. So I think we're going to have a very interesting uh, conversation this morning about what does the slavery audit have to do with forming leaders for the church? And without further ado, Dr. Powery. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, it's great to be here in, in many ways. Uh, PTS is, I see it as my theological home, uh, doing an MDiv here and, and teaching here. And um, I have lots of memories, lots of stories. <laughs> But this will not be a tell-all tabloid <laughs> talk this morning. Um, and it's interesting, um, Gordon referred to Duke being the wilderness. But what's funny is Princeton could be the wilderness. It's been called the golden cage um, by many. And this might also be on your mind because of where I work. Um, if you're into Duke men's basketball, just to let you know, I'm not the pastor of Zion Williamson, okay? <laughs> Let's be clear. 
All right. Um, my uh, remarks talk is under the title, um, Do This in Remembrance of Me, Black Bodies and the Future of Theological Education. And I'll begin with an African proverb just to throw this out there as we begin. Until the story of the hunt is told by the lion, the tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. As I stand here, I remember that 20 years ago in May, I graduated with my MDiv from this place, right, this coming May. I was five years old at the time. <laughs> and so I dedicate this particular talk to my former black professor mentors, Geddes Hansen, Peter Paris, and Brian Blunt. And when I was on the homiletics faculty here, I lived in the house the Reverend Edler Hawkins built. Hawkins was the first black professor at the seminary and the first black faculty member to teach preaching. So I'm reminded of the great cloud of witnesses that have come before us and on whose shoulders I stand. But I also stand on the shoulders of those, to borrow the words of James Weldon Johnson, who are gone, forgot, unfamed, untaught, unknown, unnamed. The broad topic of the formation of faith leaders is intriguing to me because the language of formation raises some questions and has some underlying assumptions. It assumes that the ones who are doing the forming actually know what they are doing. It assumes that there is no such thing as malformation, especially when we consider theological institutions that don't bleed, although they are built on the blood, back, sweat, and tears of the enslaved. Actually, generally speaking, theological institutions' patterns of formation have basically been about malformation or only conformation. Think like me, look like me, speak like me, be me. That is white. So the language of formation in my mind is a language of power. Because who is doing the forming and for what and into what form? or even the language of disciplines in the academy is problematic. Who or what is being disciplined and who is doing the disciplining? Troubling language in the long wake of theological colonialism. Thus I approach this broad topic of the formation of leaders with some humble hesitation and some fear and trembling. What I wanna explore this morning is how Jesus Christ who was in the form of God took on the form of a slave and being found in human form, humbled himself to the point of death on a cross, and how this wounded theological formation in the very being of God converges with the woundedness of black enslaved bodies. From this cultural and theological relationality in conjunction with the history of the relationship between Princeton Seminary and slavery, it will become clear how at the root and heart of theological education writ large is a wound a bleeding heart and broken body, both black and Christic. Therefore, if slavery was an assault on black humanity, including the black body, then theological education paired with and shaped by slavery embodied the same type of violence through its mission and curriculum. That is the sanctified erasure of black personhood, Christianity and scholarship. This talk will focus on the implications of this history for the mission and curriculum of theological schools, especially as it pertains to wounded black bodies. The key exploratory question will be, what would theological education look like if it was reimagined through the lens of these black human wounds? So first, a personal memory. When I think of Duke over the last several years, what stands out to me, since it is an institution in the American South, is the ongoing struggles related to what W.E.B. Du Bois refers to in his 1903 book, The Souls of Black Folk, as the problem of the 20th century. That is, the problem of the color line. What Du Bois did not realize is that he was a seer because this problem continues well into the 21st century, even at Duke, dare I say, even at PTS. This problem, this tortured history of racism, still haunts and hounds our present day as it echoes down the acoustical corridors of human history. While at Duke, I have seen the existential problem of racism and ethnic hatred on campus and anti-Semitism, racial slurs and the N-word plastered on a sign for the Mary Lou Center for Black Culture, the hanging of a noose 
outside of the student center early one morning on the very day Dr. James Cone, the preeminent black theologian, was slated to present a lecture entitled The Cry of Black Blood. I have seen and heard all of the opinions, struggles, and actions over Confederate monuments, including the removal of the Robert E. Lee statue from the front entrance of Duke University Chapel, where I serve. So let's picture this and what it might mean. A statue of Robert E. Lee at the entrance of Duke Chapel right, is a symbol for how the door into Christianity has historically been white supremacy. That is, when you enter the Christian house of God through this perspective, it has been for the worship of a white God that is whiteness. So it's, it is the endorsement um, of the worship of whiteness, not the worship of God in Jesus Christ, who was a poor, brown-skinned, Middle Eastern migrant born in a Bethlehem barrio. The church is complicit in the history of slavery, from Georgetown Catholics to Princeton uh, Presbyterians. And so even the report of the Historical Audit Committee about Princeton Seminary and slavery has drops of black blood all over it. And these white theological ghosts of oppression still loom large in our traditional approach to theological education and what counts as the canon, real theology, real scholarship, real church, and real liturgy. There are issues even at Duke and beyond at the institutional level. But there is one moment at Duke that stands out to me, which was personal for me. After one of Duke Chapel's Sunday morning uh, 11 a.m. services, I heard a sound that unsettled me and still haunts me. Early in my tenure at Duke, as the first uh, black dean of the university chapel, first Baptist, and really first Bapticostal, <laughs> we, we invited Raphael Warnock, the senior minister of the historic Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, the church where Daddy King uh, was pastor, where Dr. King was nurtured as a child. We invited him to preach at the chapel. One of his choirs also came to provide music for that service. And this in and of itself was not unusual really for Duke Chapel, which has historically invited black preachers to come. It was a great service. Uh, people still talk about that service. So overall, it was a so-called success. But it's what I learned after the service that has haunted me. After the service, when I reached home, my wife told me uh, that my daughter Mariah, who was 10 at the time, she's almost 17, so pray for me. <laughs> She leaned over to her mother and asked her a question during the service. And the question to her mother was, is daddy going to get fired? What would make a 10-year-old girl, after seeing and hearing blackness in sermon and song, ask this question inside of Duke Chapel? Is daddy going to get fired? My initial response to my daughter after learning about this was, well, baby, if I get fired for this, they don't need or want me here. Is daddy going to get fired? No one had said anything to her, as far as I know, to make her raise this piercing question. To be honest, it pierced my heart, and I thought, what did I bring my family to? A predominantly white Christian mainline worshiping congregation rooted in the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant tradition, an academic elitist university chapel that is Anglophile. This I knew, but I never thought such a question would spill out of the mouth of a 10-year-old girl, my daughter. Her question has haunted me. Is daddy going to get fired? Was it the soulful gospel sound with its distinct cultural harmonies at a higher volume? Was it the collective darker hues in leadership and an unconscious conscious awareness of how communal blackness has historically been viewed as a threat? Was there a sense that an invisible liturgical, theological, cultural, racial, ethnic, denominational fence had been erected not for dogs but for difference of any kind? Did she sense the white policing gaze and know that blackness is often demonized and ultimately destroyed so now daddy was going to lose his job? That question is a haunting echo that reverberates in my theological imagination for today. Is daddy going to get fired? What this raises for me are the subtle ways racial and ethnic difference and other forms of human variation can be called into question and made to feel invalid or less than, subpar, and worse, subhuman, under the policing gaze and control of white supremacy. What made Moriah speak this question? What had she heard or seen or experienced in her young life to say this? My daughter's question in the particular context out of which her question rose, arose points to the historical cultural memory 
and colonial legacy in which blackness, including black bodies, is interrogated, destroyed, and erased from human existence, even in theological classrooms. There is a psychic and material wound that haunts and hinders the flourishing of the church and theological studies. This wound is a haunting echo that we can still hear today. with the troubles of the world, the troubles of the world, the troubles of this old world. Soon will be done with the troubles of the world going home to live with God no more we Wailing no more, oh, no more weeping and wailing no more, oh, no more weeping and wailing. Going home to live with God. That was a personal memory, cultural memory. So if we think about black religious experience, one can think of it as the meeting of God in the depth of despair and loneliness of slavery. So to talk about the black body in history, we can think of it as terror, right? Of unjust historical subjugation because, and because these are the roots of theological education or discipline. Our theological schools such as Princeton Seminary are haunted by the ghosts of slavery. And they even are talking through the feedback on the sound. <laughs> and slavery is not easily forgotten, nor should it be, right? Especially when considering the black body. You know the story of the Middle Passage, enslaved black bodies moaning through each racked body, lament, dancing and swaying in the belly of the slave ships. All right, Africans upon their arrival in the new land were reborn as property, not humanity. It's been called corporeal terrorism because American slavery unleashed an all out assault on the black body, right? Being deemed non bodies, non beings, chattel, sold at auction blocks, dehumanized, dishonored. And so even at the auction block, one can say that they were possessions whom at the liturgy of the auction block were nothing but a body, a raw material, a zombie made by powerful acts. And so their humanity was erased while their bodies were wounded, sometimes wearing rope neckties. Black bodies were deemed worthless, 
even if we think about how they were physically marked through branding, a sign of possession, and whip scarring, which was a sign of punishment. These were the signatures of slavery, right? Scarring the black body as repulsive or what Emily Towns calls the grim aesthetic of blackness. Even James Baldwin's father believed black was ugly, right? which led to his own self-loathing. But on this point of being marked, I find it interesting that sometimes black theology is called marked theology. In light of the history of Christian colonialism, perhaps a better term is branded or whipped theology. Black backs were not as human, Howard Thurman would say, up against a wall, but worse, black backs and bodies were the walls on which white supremacist colonial theological graffiti was branded and whipped. Black walls of sinfully inscribed skin tell a story about the woundedness of theological education, right? And so even think of the story of Sam Hose. Sam Hose was a black farm laborer in Georgia in, who in April 28, 1899, was charged with killing his white employer over a dispute about wages. And his torture is described like this. Before the torch was applied to the pyre, the Negro was deprived of his ears, fingers, and genital parts of his body. He pleaded pitifully for his life while the mutilation was going on, but stood the ordeal of fire with surprising fortitude. Before the body was cool, it was cut to pieces, the bones crushed into small bits, and even the tree upon which the wretch made his fate was torn up and disposed of as souvenirs. The Negro's heart was cut into several pieces, as was also his liver. Those unable to obtain the ghastly relics direct paid their more fortunate possessors extravagant sums for them. Small pieces of bones went for 25 cents, and a bit of liver crisply cooked sold for 10 cents. Sam Hose was deemed a nobody who in the end had nobody, due to it being broken and dishonored. Sam was not just wounded, he was obliterated. And his destruction was endorsed by the legacy of Christianity that only perpetuates this colonized demonization of the physical black body, revealing the deep destructive notes or roots of theological education that has dismembered blackness even as it is being dismembered and is dying a slow death in this country as seminaries close or merge in order to survive. Maybe theological education itself needs to be mutilated and torn apart in order to be reborn. Amen. And so if we think about the connection, this, the human body has had a tenuous role within Christianity, right? The body has been deemed dangerous, threatening, unruly, it's mistrusted, it's feared, it's seen as flesh, the equation of flesh with the body, um, and the body's to be disciplined. It's the Cartesian mentality of the mind over the body, the soul over the body, reason over desire, rational, rationalization as the ethic of world mastery, controlling passions, the body, sexuality, etc. And so this Christian devaluing of the body is interwoven with the heritage of slavery, uh, in that Christian masters of slaves prioritize the soul over the body. Riggins Earl says this prioritization leads to pro-slavery literature in which the slave of African origin is in theory made in God's image, but it was, it was the unchangeable blackness of the slave's body which signified the demonic. And so the black body in particular was seen as evil, worthless. Right? So the black body, whether in slavery or in the church, has not been esteemed considered to be of any value historically. Black bodies have been deemed no bodies. And in this way, we can say that Christian theology and practice has wounded black bodies. Now for a theological memory snapshot. Despite this hurtful legacy of Christianity that denigrates the body's potential in general and the black body in particular, at the heart of Christian revelation is the incarnation of the divine into a human physical body. The word became flesh and lived among us, reveals how the divine embraces the body by the divine word, becoming a human body, living as any human being, the divine being housed in a body like ours. So the form of God takes on a human form, and more specifically, the form of a slave that leads to death. This means God's own body in Christ is wounded, 
reminding us of the incarnated suffering body at the heart of Christian belief. This theological memory of Christianity interweaves the cultural memory of broken black bodies with the tortured and broken body of Christ. So traditionally, culturally, and theologically, there is a wound. Okay, there's a wound. That's the, that's the, the point I'm trying to make. And historically, you've seen African Americans identifying with the story of Jesus' own suffering as their story. This is what, where James Cone picks up in one of his last books, the relationship between the cross and the lynching tree, calling Christ a lynched black body. So real fleshy dark bodies hung out to dry and die on wooden crosses. So the heart of the Christian faith is a tortured body that we hear ringing through the spirituals. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Or even the, the, a sermon, the crucifixion, found in James Weldon Johnson's God's trombones. Jesus, my darling Jesus, groaning as the blood came spurting from his wound. And many Good Friday sermons, even as we approach Holy Week, focus on the seven last words of Christ, his final words before his crucifixion. And those are important, but let's not forget that what happens to him on the cross happens to his body. Right? Jesus is not just a word, but he's a word made flesh, and it's his flesh that is wounded for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. Christ's body on the cross was glory, according to John, but we must never forget that it was also gory. His wounds declare the word of God. So Jesus is not a well-manicured, pedicured, nip-and-tuck, Botox, cosmetic, plastic surgery-seeking Christ, and the wounds of the crucifixion were not erased by the resurrection. So we can say, in light of this, Christian theology itself is wounded at its heart. So when the form of God integrates with the form of the black slave through its wounded state, one can talk of a wounded God just as the enslaved were wounded. Therefore, theological education is wounded and has wounded. Through this witness of wounds, there are implications for the mission and curriculum of theological schools. And so as we look toward the future of the theological education, how do we salvage the wounds? Or what would theological education look like if it was reimagined through the lens of black human wounds? So now, foreshadowing, remembering theological education, four possibilities. First, through the lens of black human wounds, the mission and curriculum of theological schools would demonstrate clear attunement to black human suffering. Like Howard Thurman wrote in Jesus and the Disinherited, theological schools would turn their attention to those whose backs are up against the wall. Not the wealthy, not the donor base, but those enduring suffering and oppression, those on the borderlands of human existence. The hungry, the thirsty, the naked, the prisoner, the enslaved, the Black Lives Matter activists who put their lives and reputations on the line, as we heard last night from Darnell Moore. Those unemployed, those who don't have health care, those in public schools with inadequate resources. This would also mean that truth telling through the practice of lamentation should be a part of theological education. Classes on the voice and practice of lament would broaden the theological curriculum, would open the door to wider expressions of the faith that clearly acknowledge human suffering. Secondly, through the lens of black human wounds, the mission and curriculum of theological schools would affirm black humanity and humanity in general. So historically, Christianity and its associated theological schools have wounded black bodies and been part of the ongoing colonial problem. Theological education has language issues, which I've raised earlier, not just the term disciplines, but even to say master or master of divinity is problematic in light of this discussion. The latter, master of divinity, might even suggest how traditionally white colonial masters thought they could even master God and control God because they were God. If we continue to use this language of master, we perpetuate mastery, but none of us are masters of divinity. As Brad Braxton has written, we are to be mastered by divinity. Master language only conjures up slave language, and again, who or what is enslaved or disciplined in our schools? Often it has been blackness, black people, black Christianity, black scholarship. So rethinking our language might be helpful. Also, there's an irony in that as we search for divinity in theological schools, many lose their humanity and don't take care of themselves physically, mentally, and spiritually. How might theological education humanize others? Yeah. 
rather than dehumanize. One way to affirm black humanity is by including scholarship of black thinkers in our courses and syllabi regardless of the topic. If we never read from black culture and theology and black thought in general, what are we saying to those who are black? This would be a subtle reminder of the historical demonization of blackness, suggesting who's in and who's out within the classroom setting. It would be an educational erasure in which black thought and life are removed from anything of value like theological education, and it would send a message that blackness is not good enough, not human enough. But through the lens of the wounded enslaved, one can affirm the cultural production of the enslaved by using it in the classroom, the spirituals, the stories, the sermons, and other forms of black aesthetics. The black enslaved thought could be presented as a form of wisdom theology. Amen. And this knowledge would stem from those ignored, disregarded, and discarded, the unknown, forgotten, unfamed, unnamed, unwanted, and unlettered, those whose voices, bodies, knowledge, and wisdom are usually not considered to be a part of the theological canon. The so-called illiterate would be our teachers, which might offer an opportunity for gaining a greater sense of intellectual and cultural humility. This could be a humanizing gesture toward black, um, blackness. Thirdly, through the lens of black human wounds, the mission and curriculum of theological schools would embrace the spirit more freely. I say this, I say this because anti-blackness is anti-spirit. An assault on the black body is an assault on God the spirit. I say this because to turn to the spirit is to turn to the human, the black human, because pneumatology embraces materiality and physicality as the incarnation reveals. So when W.E.B. Du Bois refers to the frenzy of black slave religion, this is the fusion of the somatic and the pneumatic, body and spirit. It's no surprise that slavery with its anti-black dehumanization was death wielding because the spirit is life and humanizing. Black bodies call us to pay attention to the spirit, which is why Sean Copeland calls, calls the scene of baby Suggs preaching in the clearing about loving the flesh and Toni Morrison's beloved, a liturgy of the spirit. Theological schools need to be to more fully embrace people and faculty from spirit traditions and offer classes on the spirit without shame and fear. For a spiritless curriculum will be death for the future of the church. I remember when I was a seminary student that a professor introduced me to a visitor by saying, Luke's a Pentecostal, but a smart Pentecostal. The old stereotypes about who's in and who's out theologically, who's acceptable and valid, must be let go. Because we ought not to be fooled if we take Ezekiel in the Valley of Dry Bones seriously. There's a particular moment in that story where he prophesied as he'd been commanded. He prophesied. Suddenly there was a noise, a rattling. Uh, the bones came together, bone to its bone. He looked and there were sinews on them. Flesh had come upon them. Skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. No breath in them. No spirit in them. If we aren't careful, this is what our theological institutions will look like. Christian zombies looking pristine and privileged like Princeton and well put together on the outside, but at its core, at its heart, in its curriculum, there's no breath, no spirit, no life, just death. So I would urge theological schools to get their curriculum baptized in the spirit. Fourth and finally, through the lens of black human wounds, the mission and curriculum of theological schools would promote the body as a site of theological knowledge in the classroom. Because so much damage has been done to black bodies historically by Christians, revealing how the body is good and useful and loved as a source of theological knowledge and insight would be helpful. It would be a way to say amen to baby Sugg's sermon in the clearing about the flesh that needs to be loved. The body would be affirmed as an epistemological resource and act as a resistance to what has been called the hegemony of textualism. Performance studies classes and programs already do this, and the PTS speech classes move in that direction as well, loving the flesh, our bodies and voices, but I'm speaking of particularly black ones. How might we learn through black bodies and come to see God in new ways and understand ministry with new eyes? A focus on the body will remind us that humans are more than a head on a stack of books. Mm 
And so just some closing remarks, and this is a conclusion, not the first conclusion that fo is followed by another conclusion. Okay. I know how that is, so I'm, I'm closing it now. Gordon. These four possibilities that I raise are just the beginning. Some initial gestures for the future of theological education. Theological education may be wounded, and it has wounded black bodies, but the form of God taking on the form of a slave should challenge us to reconsider how we are doing theological education today in light of the wounded body of Jesus and wounded black bodies. Willie Jennings writes that speaking the gospel in public, rooted in the slave's position, aims at a much more intense public reality, that of addressing the powers that enslave people economically, politically, socially, spiritually, and physically. This kind of public address, he says, by its very nature exposes networks of oppression and violence that run through any given society and connects people through the gospel to a shared work of announcing the will of God for human flourishing. That God's body became a slave's body in Christ should matter for how we teach, preach, think, and serve. Amen. Through the wounds, we may discover a future for theological education. I have offered this brief talk in remembrance of the many thousand gone. Those gone, forgot, unfamed, untaught, unknown, unnamed. Those black enslaved theologians without a portfolio. They were unlettered, but are our teachers nonetheless. And at their wellsprings of knowledge and at the heart of their broken bodies, we drink and bow to learn what we did not know or could not know about God without them. I have remembered the dismembered to remember the future of theological education. The unmarked tombs of the enslaved remind us that the wound is the womb for the future of theological education. Amen. Black bodies, even if wounded, should be loved in our schools, our churches, and the world. Because as the poet Rumi reminds us, the wound is the place where the light enters you. May the light shine brighter in the future of theological education. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Priory, for that stimulating and I think um, talk that I think will linger in my imagination for quite some time. If theological education could previously assume a future apart from the questions of race and racism, then the Obama years, renewed attention to police shootings, and the reactionary rise of the current administration shattered such delusions. And if PTS could imagine a future apart from a reckoning and repair, and the hard truths laid bare by the audit has shattered such naivete. I want to suggest that the current crisis of theological education is precisely theological in its shape. In my own teaching, I'm constantly confronted by a haunting question of both pedagogy and theology. The theology I teach cannot speak in Ferguson, that the students with whom I learn cannot prophesy in Baltimore. If our interpretations of scripture do not declare grace and justice in Charleston, if our convictions lead us to places of neutrality in Charlottesville, if theological education does not animate us to respond to a hurricane's destruction of Puerto Rico, if what happens in my biblical studies classroom does not reckon and seek to repair the wound the seminary has promulgated and benefited from and suffered under, then it is our theology worthy of its name. A theology that stands mute before racial animus and violence is not worthy of the God who creates and liberates us. So these are urgent matters for us because the racial and ethnic composition of the country is changing in dramatic ways. As we know, by the year 2040, we will no longer be a majority-minority nation, but a nation of many minority populations. That is, by 2040, no one ethnic group will be able to declare itself a numerical majority. But for theological education, this reality is not a concern for the future, but the present. Juan Martinez has noted that theological schools in the U.S. will confront a 2040 moment in the next decade, not in 25 years. Demographically, the church is leading the way. It's high time for our theologies and our pedagogies, and yes, theological education as an enterprise, to catch up. Amen. The transformation we need is not just numerical. 
We ought not imagine ourselves successful of the faces of our students or our church members are more numerous and colorful than before. Our theology, our pedagogies, our epistemologies need to become more colorful as well in order to meet in a new and vibrant way the God who revels in our differences. So how then might theological educa education address the theological, ministerial, and pedagogical opportunities present in theological education today? So I propose three paired statements to help us continue a complex but vital conversation. So first, our, both our response to the audit is not solely about the racial and ethnic identities of the students in our classrooms or the faculty who teach them, and our response to the audit is pedagogical and thus profoundly about who our faculty and who our students are. That is, the presence of racial and ethnic minority students or faculty in institutions of theological education are both essential and insufficient. That is, students need faculty from diverse backgrounds to help nurture the kind of leader that can engage the work of ministry with intercultural competence, and faculty need, need a diverse student body that will stretch us, lead us to learn more and more about the ways in which God is moving in our world today. But mere presence is not enough. Too often, institutions have assumed that students and scholars of color will do the work of repair on behalf of the institution. They can serve on the committees and work groups that will tell the rest of the institution how to do this work. Their mere presence in these meetings is proof positive that we are headed in the right direction an institution might imagine. But if authority is not invested in these handful of minoritized people, then such striving towards embracing difference will falter towards repair. If the institution outsources repair efforts to those faculty and students who are already champions, then such striving is doomed from the first. Presence is not enough. Presence without the power to implement substantive change and the institutional support to make such change a key part of the mission of the institution will avail little. So repair may be riskier than we first might think. A true embrace of repair in our classrooms means a substantive shift in how and why we teach. That is, the repair we must embrace is not just demographic. It's pedagogical and theological at its core. So second, our response to the audit cannot just be about raw numbers. And our response to the audit must be strategic. If presence is not enough, then neither are numbers. That is, the best measure of our response, the scope of our, of our repair, is not just a census of students and faculty of color, but the transformation such, such students and faculty bring in their wake. No recruitment effort can substitute the kind of strategic work that is required not just to host repair, um, but to welcome it, to embrace it at the core of the learning endeavor. That is that even our work towards racial and ethnic diversities are not just incidental to the mission of the theological school, but an indispensable ingredient in our time. And so the hard work of repair must be strategic. It must be a grassroots effort of champions of, of repair who keep the work before the institution, who are irritants of the status quo and allies of the minoritized. Repair must also be a strategic effort that starts from the top, so to speak. Presidents and deans and boards must meet the grassroots to effect true pedagogical and theological transformation. Third, our response to the audit is not just about survival or getting past or through this moment of reckoning. And our response to the audit is a theological imperative. I think this is perhaps most important in my mind. We might be tempted to see the ATS data about the 2040 moment in our schools and imagine that somehow just more diverse students and faculty will save our institutions from this moment. We might hope that more diverse students and faculty will help our institutions survive in a time of crisis. But I think such an approach misses the opportunity before us. In theological education, repair is a theological imperative, not a Hail Mary when all hope is lost. In theological education, repair is not the last gasp of a dying institution, but a rebirth, a resurrection that God has effected. We might be tempted to look at the changing demographics of our communities and seeing constituencies of color a way through a difficult time. And this gets it half right. Racial and ethnic equity is not just an escape hatch, but a new path altogether for theological education. Racial and ethnic equities are not just the markets that theological schools might reach, but the very source of the transformation our schools and churches most need today. So beyond these three, pair state, three pairs of statements, let me add 
three sets of questions inspired by Dr. Powery's lecture. First, it strikes me that we must not stop with the metaphor, uh, with the metaphor of the wound as a metaphor. That wound is literal, it's real, and it's tangible. I was recently at a conference where, with our former colleague here, Yolanda Pierce, um, and in her work at the African American Museum in, in the Smithsonian, she said one of the hardest parts of her work was dealing with white families bringing to the museum or wondering what to do with the remnants of lynch bodies that they were in their grandmothers and great grandmothers' attics. What do we do with these literal wounds? In what ways can this wound become visible to those who cannot see it or choose not to see it? In what ways can those afflicted by such wounds be given space to name such a wound and demand repair? In what ways can the architectures of the space, both literal and metaphorical, reflect not just the symbol of the wound, but its tangibility in actual, literal human bodies? Second, the, the, I think the effect of the woundedness of black bodies spills over. That wound afflicts brown bodies, LGBTQ plus bodies, migrant and immigrant bodies, minoritized bodies, disabled bodies. That is what happens when an institution's theological center chooses to mark as normative one set of bodies, one set of experiences. Such normativity shapes each and everything we teach and preach and do. There is no discipline in the academy left untouched. There is no practice a pedagogy left untouched. There is no people left untouched. The third, related to this point, how can our pedagogies center bodies and not brains? That is, the wound Dr. Powery described as that of a body, not just the intellect, not just a cognitive wound. No, we have, we have heard about bodies wounded, about flesh harmed. In theological education, then, incarnation is not just a theological doctrine. Incarnation is a pedagogical commitment. So how do we teach bodies, not just brains, bodies that feel and think and move, not just brains that are empty vessels meant to be filled by the expert in the front of the room? So just a handful of conclusions. When I think about this work, I can't help but think about um, another wound, and that of my own community. On September 6, 2017, Hurricane Maria made landfall on the island of Puerto Rico, the place of my birth and that of my nearest ancestors. For me, Maria and its aftermath lay bare that the Christian tradition itself is a problem. Yes, we're, this is, Maria was a political crisis and an environmental crisis, but what if we had before us is also and profoundly so a theological crisis? What if churches have cast a biblical and ethical imagination that has shriveled our capacities to love neighbors near and far? What if our teaching at theological schools has formed preachers and leaders who have fed a colonial imagination more concerned with ownership than with grace, power more than partnership, acquisition more than curiosity? What if a theological lamentation stands behind the generous support of victims of other hurricanes, but not the brown citizens of a tropical island? Colonial imagination in the tradition has taught us that the peoples of the world are means, not ends. That people and their lands are only as valuable as the goods they can produce for the colonial center. Colonial imagination has taught us that it is better to be right than it is to be loving. Colonial imagination has taught us that biblical interpretation is an act of grasping, of ownership, of claiming readings of scripture as singular and as right and as universal because they are mine and mine alone. In short, we have inherited and then consumed a marred theological imagination. And that theological imagination is now consuming the migrant at the border, the refugee fleeing in danger, the queer communities rejected and excluded, communities of color policed to their very deaths, and too often the black and brown students sitting in the classrooms at seminaries across the nation. A warped theological imagination has fed us a lie that we own the table to which we invite others, that we are perpetual hosts and others are perpetual guests, that hospitality is something we give, rarely something we receive. We imagine ourselves as those who might house someone fleeing in danger, 
and rarely do we imagine ourselves as the refugee. And such an imagination, my friends, was not birthed at the tip of a spear, at the head of an army, or even on the bow of a ship heading to a new land. Any Hamilton fans? Anyway, sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, that imagination wormed its way and into our lives through preaching and prayer, the reading of scripture, and the parceling out of grace. The tradition we have inherited at PTS is a problem. And one name of that problem is colonial imagination. That problem has killed 3,000 Puerto Ricans and tossed the migrant into a cage and stolen land that is not our, not our own and claimed human bodies as instruments of commerce. The tradition is a problem. We have no choice but to name it, to narrate it, to repair it, and perhaps with God's help to heal the wound. Thank you. Nothing wakes me up like listening to Luke Powery preach. When he lectures, he can't help preaching. <laughs> and yeah, amen. Uh, I want to speak from my uh, identified place. Uh, I identify as white, privileged. Those are social constructions that I've inhabited, inhabited and capitalized upon functioning in a place of privilege with a particular point of view. My place is a well-feathered nest. I've been waking up all my life to white privileged female, what that means, white privileged female. I had the good fortune, at least of growing up in a northern white church uh, that wasn't all white. And um, so difference was there from the beginning. And yet that doesn't fix you. White privilege isn't just something you have, it's something you are. And the package comes very conveniently with blindness to the racialized nature of white. Female, on the other hand, in my fundamentalist setting was another thing. It was a take a seat and listen kind of thing. It was. Uh, if you think you're called, you're wrong about that kind of thing. And so it was a complex kind of white privilege, but the white privilege was all there nonetheless. If the motto of my teachers of color, and among those teachers I count my students of color, is stay woke, then mine has been get woke because you can't hide from the light. The slavery audit tells the truth to those who, like me, are heirs to the privileged whiteness of our forebears. The very ground we're standing on here now testifies against us. As a preacher, I can't help but turn then also to the text, and in keeping uh, with hearing the Gospel of Luke, I've been turning often to the Gospel of Luke. <laughs> And I've made my, my uh, students turn off and too to the Gospel of Luke, as they could testify. A first point, pe uh, preaching is, as Luke and I argue in our book, a locally embodied, spirit-driven, theological rereading of the grittiness of a preacher's time and place. Preaching is always from a place. It is always embodied. You can't be a disembodied preacher. You arrive in the pulpit with the skin you've been issued. You also can't start from some mid-air place theologically. Every reading of the biblical witness starts from a place, the socially constructed place of the preacher's identity. That's the only valid starting point. So we can't pretend to start with a theological concept as if that didn't come already packaged in a place. I think we could hardly wish for a better example of this spirit-infused theological rereading of gritty reality of the present moment than Mary, Mary's song at the end of the first chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Mary is a woman of color. She is not socially or economically privileged. She isn't highly educated. Her body is regarded as broken, already messed up because she bears an unwanted preg pregnancy from everybody else's point of view, an unauthorized pregnancy. Hers is a wounded body already. 
She isn't highly educated, but she clearly knows the voice of God when she hears it. And late in the first chapter of Luke's Gospel, Mary finds herself in the validating presence of the spirit that is moving powerfully in the womb of her cousin Elizabeth. Note the dynamics of community here to validate the voice of the preacher, the woman preacher. So summoned into speech, Mary proclaims, she preaches, she points into her world and down history into ours to declare the new thing that God is doing. She declares that the God who has acted to deliver the bowed down in the past is acting in the present moment to raise up all who have been bowed down and to dethrone the mighty from their places, to fill the hungry not just with food but with good things, and to send the rich empty-handed away. These things are connected. Luke spends the whole rest of his gospel demonstrating what this looks like. When the disenfranchised and the disregarded are raised up and the ones who seem to hold all the cards are bowed down and sent down, it happens over and over and over again in the gospel, the raising up and the sending down. Uh, You have, for example, the rich ruler who goes away empty. Why? Because he had many possessions. Or, or you get, um, you get um, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus climbs a tree. He's wealthy to start with. He climbs a tree, and Jesus calls him down. And until he comes down, there's no salvation that can get to his house. Amen. Or take the bowed down woman in the synagogue. Jesus raises her up, but her raising up also involves the taking down of the synagogue leader. And here's my riff on that. Some of my students also got this riff. What if Jesus wants to save two people in that synagogue, not just one? And the taking down is somehow prerequisite to any kind of raising up the counts, okay? So, um, all right, so I'm preaching now, too. Um, To put it in Darnell's vivid terms from last night, what it looks like when God sees to it that the feet of the powerful are taken off the necks of the bowed down, so the ones bent low by the feet of the powerful can be raised up, the ones standing on them lose their balance. The lowly raise up, the mighty stumble off their thrones. Her vision is validated Mary's vision is validated at the presentation in the temple. This child is destined for the fall and the rising of many in Israel. White privileged preachers and maybe teachers of preaching have done some selective listening to Mary. We're, we really like that raising up part. And we think that because we're already lofty, it's up to us to do the raising up. Hmm. We don't like the takedown part so much. The crafters of colonization at this place, as uh, Gordon McCoskey brilliantly pointed out, suffered from a failure of imagination. They thought that that they got that raising up part. But suffering from this disastrous failure of imagination, the only way they could imagine that raising up to happen was to sequester black bodies somewhere else, colonization. Why? The language says so that they could refashion themselves over there, out there, away from here, thank you very much, and and become sufficiently developed to come back and join the other raised up folk, the white raised up folk. And Princeton was the all too obvious unspoken example of the kind of social cultivation they had in mind. They didn't get that the ways to raising up also involves a taking down. So the way I see it, we can't pretend anymore that we have not been notified. We're accountable to Mary's whole message, which is Darnell's message, which which is the message Luke has brought us. When you take your foot off the neck you're standing on, expect to lose your balance and fall down. That's the only way God can raise you up different. 
so what is the so what for theological education? If I pretended to know that, um, I'd be writing quite a book. I don't, I, I'm not ready to write any book. What does it look like to go down? What does disinheritance look like? I don't know that, but we've got to keep talking about what the taking down part of, the, of, the, of the God's rescue operation of all of us means. I think we've over-spiritualized it, as if our, our, our humility were enough. But I, I see literal, literal coming down in the Gospel of Luke embodied coming down so that there can be a raising up. And I don't know yet what that looks like. I know it does include this. We need a revised account of what counts as excellency to which our learning goals are geared. And we need to go and seek some of those criteria of excellency in the church that is emerging, not the one that always has been. One of my greatest fears is that I'm doing a damn good job of preparing people for a church that isn't anymore. So what's that about? So, so um, as, as Eric also said, we need to get to where the church is emerging and discover what the excellencies are for which we need to help people develop, form. And it has to do with bodies congregated in ways, making noise in ways that might just make us really nervous. <laughs> God help us. Uh, that's exactly what we need. And it seems to me that there's, we've got to come down or go out, depart, go out of the house, go out of the house that we felt safe in and uh, go into the house of the Lord, which is a lot um, bigger and a lot different. I also think a lot of what that means for teaching preaching. I think that the effort, ways of the word took a step in a direction, but I don't think it's all the way there yet. I think we've all, always thought of that as provisional, We're trying to build a bridge to something that is still emerging. Above all, it needs to be embodied. And we, we need to be willing. Those of us who are white and privileged, we need to be willing to lose our balance. Thank you. So I'm going to give a few minutes for uh, the three colleagues here to interact with each other. Uh, I'm sure they already have been, but let's do that in some real time. So we're going to give five or ten minutes for that, and then we'll open it up for more broad conversation. So, Well, I, I think um, just I wonder if just what um, Sally says, that's the most fresh in my mind. Um, I wonder this idea of the down, right, this, and Luke to go down. I wonder if... Um, which I think that's what you, what does it look like to go down, even though I think you're pointing to this ascension to, you know, to get up. But it would seem that the, the goal is um, to go down, like, the, uh, and, and that is the goal, like, the descent is where the victory is. Um, um, well, there I am using the motif of the, of the lowering and the rising. Um, and I, I think that that also has some difficult and some um, um, awkward um, and, and less than helpful uh, dynamics if we map it too directly onto our own space. Um, it, I'm, I'm always about, um, again, as students would attest, um, that we are not undertaking any of this in a God-forsaken world as if, as, as if this all had to happen by our own energies. God is already doing the taking down and the raising up. We're supposed to just discern it and get with it, uh, participate in what already is going on. And the going on is in things like the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, it's, it's in the church as well, but we've got to pay attention to those dynamics. What I mean by that is, is, is to be dethroned. Um, that's the language of Mary's 
song is to be throned and dethroned and emptied. And maybe those are the more useful because they speak toward power and possession. Yeah, I mean, I think the going down is also helpful because even in thinking about um, Jesus going into Jerusalem, up to Jerusalem, but down, it, it, right? And, and so it, it's the idea that is the goal, right? The ascent is a, de- is a death, right? And in some ways, even with the Zacchaeus story, come down, God is always trying for us to get our feet on the ground, to come down, to be more closer to the earth, what's going on in the real world, um, what's going on in our bodies, wants us to be close to the earth, to be humus from, of the earth, human, to become human again, and not hang out in trees and in other places. And that theological education somehow um, should challenge us, push us towards the ground, Amen. push us more towards our humanity, our common humanity even. Um, in many ways, our, our implicity in the wounds, how we have caused wounds and how we ourselves are wounded, um, and telling the truth about that. One thing I was struck by in Sally's comments in particular about, you know, are we uh, educating students into a church that no longer exists? I've been thinking more and more that, um, that's, that maybe that insight is profoundly necessary, that we do not know the shape of the church into which we are educating our students. Because as the church is changing so radically as it is right now, we don't know what that church is gonna look like. Um, And I think that might seem like a really scary pedagogical um, challenge is that we don't know where our students gonna be. But I think there's a lot of opportunity there because we are nurturing them to be leaders of a church that we know God is already birthing somewhere. But we don't know exactly where it is. We don't know what it looks like, except that scripture tells us where to look. And that's to look on the margins, to look uh, to a young, uneducated woman in the middle of Galilee proclaiming the deliverance of of God's people. Um, So I think this brings us back to, I think, an epistemology. So if um, I wonder if the failure of theological imagination that Gordon has been talking about is to think that we have apprehended and captured and can grasp the shape of the, the, the shape of the church that God wants us to pursue. Um, and what if that's always gonna be beyond our grasp? It's not something that we can own, not something that we can claim, not something that we can build here at this seminary. But what we can do is to, it's a different kind of epistemology, not one about ownership, but one about grace, one that says we just, we, we, we educate students into a sensibility, into a wisdom to listen deeply to God's voice in the lives of their neighbors. And then we let them loose into God's world, and we learn from them the shape of the church. We don't simply import that, import it into them like a USB uh, drive that we stick into their brains. Um, that it's a really different educational model. Um, I think to me that's one of the the deep implications of the audit is that it, it gets back to the very the very thing that we're doing in the classroom and what we think we're accomplishing. I mean, I think that raises what you're pointing to is how do we even as teachers in theological education or leaders, how do we even come to know, right, what the church is, which is where, I mean, I think there's problems with the language of formation, because how do, we're assuming that we know how people should be formed, and I just don't think that's the case, Um, and so it's how, it raises the question of how do we come to know uh, what the church is, or is becoming, the church is always becoming, so what the church is becoming, and um, for me, and that's, that happens you know, outside of the classroom space in many ways, and how do we gain that knowledge, even as teachers within theological education, um, without um, assuming that we, we know it all? Right? I think that there's a sense of intellectual and spiritual humility, I think, um, that is required. And um, just to comment on that, that maybe that formation partly is pedagogies of, of, of going out to where we are unbalanced, um, unbalanced enough to be at, at the mercy of the spirit um, and dependent on bodies 
very unlike our own, in order to listen, have the ears for the spirit and, and the sight. Really briefly, so I wonder if maybe the, the, f the problem with formation is that we've assumed it's unilateral, that that's mm -hmm. the institution forming students. Maybe the problem is that we, we might maybe assume it's bi just bilateral, it's students forming the institution, us forming students. But it's actually far more complex than that. It's about communities living on the ground. It's about actual human life and the complex formation that happens in all these spaces. So anyway.